Stay away from the major sins Ignore the whispers of the shehatins Oh Lord, have mercy, have mercy on our soul بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على من بعث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another episode of Soul Reflections I'm your host Abu Abdis Salam We're talking about purification of the soul and in the last episode we started a story about the great mother of the believers Aisha radiallahu anha and we spoke about how she is telling this story about herself this heart rendering story about an incident that happened during her lifetime in, in fact in the lifetime of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and she is telling us what happened and so far what had happened was they went on a journey on a ghazwa on a battle she went with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and she was placed in a hodaj a hodaj is like a tent like structure it's like a little tent that goes on top of a camel and she would sit inside this tent and then people would lift it up and then place it on top of the camel and then they would go now while they were outside of Medina on the way back after the ghazwa after the battle the Prophet ﷺ ordered them to stay the night just outside of Medina. So Aisha radiallahu anha, on the way, when the Prophet ﷺ gave the order to proceed, she went off to go to the toilet. Now obviously in the desert that's quite far. She has to walk a long distance until nobody can see her. So she walks, she answers the call of nature, comes back and realizes that she's lost her necklace. So she goes back. When she goes back, in the meantime, what happens is the people carrying her hodaj, they thought she was still in there. They lifted it, put it on the camel, and the whole army went off. Aisha radiallahu anha found her necklace, and then she came back, and she found everybody had already gone. So she says, and we're going to continue the story from there, inshallah. She says, Then I found my necklace after the army had gone. I came to their camp but found nobody therein. So I went to the place where I used to stay, thinking that they would miss me and come back in my search. She's a very intelligent young lady. Some narrations say that she was about 15 years old. Now imagine if you were left in the desert by yourself. There's scorpions, there's snakes, there might be another army, they've just come back from a battle, maybe an army might be coming after them. There could be many things, there could be robbers, you know, bandits, lots of things could happen. But this young 15 year old girl, she didn't stamp her feet and ask why me and you know, and start crying, none of this. She realized that this is the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Allah's destiny. This is what Allah has destined for her rather. And so she sat down and she went to sleep. Subhanallah, a 15 year old girl, she just simply falls asleep it's as if she has no problems. She has tawakkul in Allah. She has full trust and reliance in Allah, Lord of the worlds. That inshallah, they will miss me and they will come back to look for me. She continues. I felt sleepy and went to sleep. Safwan ibn al-Mu'attil al-Sulami al-Dhakwani was behind the army. He's another companion. He had started in the last part of the night and reached my stationing place in the morning and saw the figure of a sleeping person. So he's coming back, he's been left behind for whatever reason, and he's trying to catch up with the army. When he gets to this spot where the army had spent the night, he sees the figure of a sleeping person. So, of course, he doesn't know who it is at this stage. He came to me, she says. He came to me and recognized me on seeing me, for he 
had seen me before the verses of hijab were revealed, before veiling. I got up because of his saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, which he uttered upon recognizing me. I covered my face with my garment, and wallahi, he did not say to me any other word, a single word, except Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, until he made his camel, his she camel, kneel down, whereupon he trod on its four legs, and I mounted it. Look at this, Safwan ibn al-Mu'attil. He comes and he sees this person, the figure of a sleeping person. He comes to this sleeping person, he realizes that subhanAllah, this is Aisha radiallahu anha. This is the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is she doing here by herself in the middle of a desert? He understood that she's obviously been left behind. And all he said is, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. To Allah we belong and to Him we return. This is a great calamity. So, he knows what to do. He doesn't speak to her unnecessarily. He doesn't say to her, Oh Aisha, what happened? Sister, what happened? He knows what seems to have happened. And this was the way of the Sahaba. They wouldn't engage in free mixing unnecessarily. They would talk, but formally. They would do it with good manners. And formally, they wouldn't joke and giggle and talk beyond what was necessary between the two sexes of ghair mahram, people who are not related to each other through marriage or blood or through milk directly. So Safwan, he's not related to Aisha. So he didn't speak in an informal manner. or he, In fact, he didn't even say salam. All he said is, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And this shows us how we should behave with the opposite gender. Subhanallah. Time and time again in this very narration, we'll see how the Sahaba, they don't mix with each other, the men and the women, unless it's somebody who's a mahram, a relation. Now, here also, we benefit from this point, is that he made the she-camel kneel. He made the she-camel kneel, and then trod on its forelegs. On its front two legs, he put his foot on there, so the camel doesn't just go up. He doesn't say, oh Aisha, come and sit on the camel or anything like that. She understands what to do and he understands what he is telling her to do. He's telling her to do something very simple and he goes and he leads the way. Again, there's no informal chitter chatter yapping between them. Now, the other point here that we can benefit from, I just wanted to bring this out so we can understand difference of opinion among the scholars. We find that the scholars of Islam, they, some of them use this hadith to say that niqab, covering the face, for a woman is obligatory. Take a moment to think, how can they use this hadith for that? Well, let's backtrack a little bit. There are two opinions, as you know, among the scholars. One group of scholars, they said that niqab, or the face veil, covering the face, is not obligatory. Another group of scholars, however, they said it is obligatory. And this is a valid difference of opinion that the scholars have had from past to present. But those scholars who said it is obligatory to cover the face, and they looked at this part of the hadith when she says, He recognized me when he saw me because he had seen me before the verses of hijab were revealed. Before the verses of hijab were revealed. In some narrations, in other narrations, before veiling was ordered. So, what does this mean? She is explaining what the verses of hijab refer to. Of course, if you look at the verses of hijab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the women to cover that which is apparent, to cover themselves. So what is Allah referring to? Is He referring to the whole body? Or is He only referring to the whole body, but not the hands and face, for example? So those scholars who say that Allah is referring to everything, including the face, one of the pieces of evidence that they bring, they say, look, Aisha is explaining that the verses of hijab mean that I have to cover my face. Why? Because she says, he recognized me because he had seen me before the verses of hijab, before the command of veiling. Which means that if he had only seen me after the verses of hijab, he would not have recognized me. Can you recognize someone from their hair? No, you can't. You can only recognize them from their face. This is the most apparent thing. 
So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha is saying that if he had only seen me after the verses of hijab, he wouldn't have been able to recognize me because I cover my face. But because he had seen me before the verses of hijab were revealed, he recognized me because I never used to cover my face before the verses of hijab were revealed. Anyway, the point is that the scholars go back and forth and this is a valid difference of opinion. And I just wanted to show you that from this long narration, just from this short little sentence, how some of the scholars have come to derive certain rulings based on evidence. And that's the point that I wanted to make. Not whether niqab is obligatory or not. That's something else. That's for another time. But this is just to give an example of how scholars differed and have difference of opinion. So he treads on his camel's four legs. She gets onto the camel. And then she says, Aisha radiallahu anha said, I mounted it. Then Safwan set out leading the she-camel that was carrying me, till we met the army while they were resting during the hot midday. And what happens is that, again, this is, shows Safwan, he goes at the front. He doesn't go around the back. He goes to the front. And this shows that the man stays on the front. The woman is on the back so that the man can lower his gaze. He doesn't have to look at the sister in front of him. And we see this from Musa alayhi salam also, for example. And when the two girls, if you remember the story, they wanted to direct him to their father's house. What happened? He told them, throw stones. He didn't say, say left, say right. He said to them, throw stones. You stay behind me. Throw left if you want me to go left. Throw right if you want me to go right. Until they directed him home like this and they would follow him behind him. But this is out of extreme piety. This doesn't mean that everybody must do that. But it is out of extreme piety and it shows how scared they were of free mixing. We'll take a break and then we will look at the next part, which says, Then whoever was meant for destruction fell into destruction. After the break, inshallah, we shall know what actually happened. Assalamu alaikum. Most countries of the world ban bullying. They fight it in their schools and universities. A lot of us are being bullied differently every single day. Some come up to us and say, do this. While others say, don't you dare. Some say this is halal. While others say, nope, this is haram. Are you confused? Do you feel lost? Join me in Umdat al-Ahkam, where with the grace of Allah, we will learn the proper knowledge from the Qur'an and from the Sunnah which would help stop this kind of bullying. Join Asim Al-Hakim in Umdatul Ahkam every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 6.30 a.m. UK on Peace TV. Say he's Allah one and only. Allah, the absolute and eternal. He begets not, nor is he begotten. There is nothing like him. Focus on the source of wisdom. The Quran is a magnet. And the Sunnah is a revelation. Islam had the solution right from the beginning. We apply that and the problem is solved. Focus on the solution for our world. There is no man on the face of earth. His life was narrated to us like Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Poor, rich, white, black, Arab, non-Arab. Everybody say the same word. Obey Allah, obey the messenger. Focus on the akhirah. Tawbah is mandatory upon each and every Muslim. Success for the Muslim is having the correct belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has power over all things. Has power over all things. Focus on the facts and realities that motivate the world towards Islam in Islam in Focus, next on Peace TV. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. So here we have Safwan. We were talking about the story of Aisha radiallahu anha. She's been left behind by the army. The army carries on and then she stays in her spot. She falls asleep. 
She's by herself in the desert. Safwan ibn al-Mu'attil, he comes along on his camel. He was behind the army trying to catch up. He sees Aisha radiallahu anha sleeping. He recognizes that this is the wife of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Then she immediately covers her face and she says, By Allah, he didn't say a single word to me except Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Till he made his she camel kneel down whereupon he trod on its four legs, she says, and I mounted it. Then Safwan set out, leading the she camel that was carrying me till we met the army while they were resting during the hot midday. Then, she says, whoever was meant for destruction fell in destruction. And the leader of the false statement, the ifk, was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. Now Aisha radiallahu anha, because she was left behind, they met up with the army. Safwan was leading, they didn't speak. He just said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Because the wife of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is stuck in the desert by herself. They've left her behind without realizing. So she gets on his camel. He is walking, leading the camel. They get to the army. And people see this man Safwan radiallahu anhu and Aisha together coming. So Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul is the chief of hypocrites of Medina. This guy, he was the leader of one of the tribes. There were two tribes, Al-Aws and Khazraj. And these two polytheistic tribes, they would always fight each other. They would have skirmishes. And then you had the Jews. The Jews of Medina, they would sometimes side with Aws and sometimes they would side with Khazraj. And there would always be an imbalance of power and you know, and they would have treaties and so on and so forth. Now, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, he was a chief of one of these tribes. And he was going to become the king of Medina. They had, Aws and Khazraj had a pact. And he was about to become the king. However, the people of Medina accepted Islam. Many of them, they went to Mecca and gave bay'ah. They gave the oath of allegiance to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he migrated to Medina. So now you have this guy, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, he's lost his crown. He's about to become king and he's no longer able to become king. So he's very upset. Most of Medina have become Muslims. Aws and Khazraj, they became Muslims. So Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, he outwardly became a Muslim, but inwardly he was a kafir, munafiq. He was a hypocrite and the chief of the hypocrites. And his own son wanted to execute him because of this fact. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, he concocted this lie. He made this lie up, this slander against our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, he claimed that, or he just literally made this rumor up that Aisha had committed this major sin of zina. A'udhu billahi min thalik. It is impossible that our mother Aisha radiallahu anha committed this sin. And we shall see later on a few episodes down how Allah Jalla wa ala in the Quran freed Aisha radiallahu anha from this evil, evil accusation. And Allah from above the seven heavens revealed verses to prove the innocence of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Anyway, she says, then whoever was meant for destruction fell into destruction. And the leader of the false statement was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. In other words, he was the one who concocted this lie. Aisha says, after this, we arrived in Medina and I became ill for one month while the people were spreading the forged statements of the people of the slander. And I was not aware of anything thereof. I didn't even know about this. So for one month, I was ill. I was sick. And nobody told me what they're saying about me. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul mentioned it to some people and those people spread it. And unfortunately, even some of the Sahaba, even they started to transmit this rumor, this evil, false slander. But she says, she didn't know anything about this because she was ill for a month. 
She said, but what aroused my suspicion or my doubt while I was sick was that I was no longer receiving from Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the same kindness that I used to receive when I fell sick. Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would enter upon me and then say a greeting and add, how is that lady? And then he would depart. That aroused my suspicion, but I was not aware of the propagated evil until I recovered from my ailment. So the Prophet ﷺ, we know that he was a human being. He had feelings. And obviously the rumor has got to the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. But look at the character of the Prophet ﷺ. His wife is sick. And this rumor has come. He doesn't go directly to his wife while she's sick. Oh no. He sits there, he waits until she gets better. He doesn't want to make her even more sick. Look at the epitome of moral character of the best of creation, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What about us? If this happened to us, a'udhu billah, how would we behave? We would go out there, immediately approach our families, our spouse. What happened? Is this true? Get angry, you know, jump to some conclusions, maybe kill the other guy who's been accused. Subhanallah. But here, no, the Prophet ﷺ, he has Iman and Taqwa. He realizes that somebody is innocent until proven guilty. And even though they're innocent till proven guilty, he's not even going to verify the news. Why? Because if he verifies the news by asking Aisha, she will get even more sick. She's sick. So let me wait until she gets better. This is the great character of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. But at the same time, we realize that he is a human. He must have felt some pain. If you think about it, there are people accusing his wife of this evil, evil crime. So the Prophet wasallam, you know, he must be feeling some serious pain here. So you can see that it comes out. It comes out the way that he's dealing with Aisha radiallahu anha, but in a subtle way. You know, he can't express the same amount of love as he used to. He wouldn't address Aisha radiallahu anha directly. He would say, how is this lady? In a generic form. He would say, assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you all. And this is how the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would be. It was natural. He would feel something in his heart. So it affected him without him actually realizing it, even though he tried not to be affected by that. Then she says, I went out one night with a lady called Umm Mistah to answer the call of nature towards a place called Al Manasi. So she goes out, they used to go out. She says, the place where we used to go to relieve ourselves, this is called Al Manasi. And we used not to go out for this purpose except from night to night, every night, once a night. And that was before we had toilets close to our houses. And this habit of ours was similar to the habits of the Bedouins in the deserts or in the tents concerning the evacuation of the bowels because we considered it troublesome and harmful to take toilets in the houses. So in those days, they didn't used to have toilets in the houses. What they would do, they would go far. Even while they were living in their houses, they would go far, answer the call of nature once a night. They wouldn't eat you know, a lot like we do every day. They would go answer the call of nature at night time and then they would come back. And they would go in pairs like Aisha radiallahu anha is going with this lady called Umm Mistah who is like an auntie for her. So she says, So I went out with Umm Mistah who was the daughter of Abi Ruhm ibn Abd Manaf and her mother was the daughter of Sakhar ibn Amir who was the aunt of Abu Bakr as Siddiq and her son was Mistah ibn Uthatha. She's the cousin of Abu Bakr who is the father of Aisha radiallahu anhu majma'een and she is like an auntie of Aisha radiallahu anha. When we had finished answering the call of nature, Umm Mistah and I came back towards my house. Umm Mistah said, she stumbled over her robe, over her garment, and whereupon she said, let Mistah be ruined. I said to her, what a bad word you have said. Do you abuse a man who has taken part in the battle of Badr? And then she said, O oh, you there, 
didn't you hear what he said? Aisha says, and what did he say? And that we will find out in the next episode, insha'Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Stay away, stay away from the major sins. Ignore the whispers of the Shia tent. Oh Lord, have mercy on our souls. Stay away, stay away from the major sins. Ignore the whispers of the Shia tent. Oh Lord.